Just the king. The king. He's the king. The king of music. King. He is the king. He's the king. He's great. I love him. He's the king. He will always be the king, no matter what. It's time for the King's Cast, an unofficial Elvis fan podcast with your host, Anthony Raimondo. Get your popcorn ready, find your seats, the gates are open, and the show is about to begin. All right! Come on in, the gates are open! Welcome to the King's Cast. I am Anthony Ramondo, your host, and we are off and running. Episode one is underway. There's no turning back now. This, as you heard off the top from our lovely uh, and beautiful intro voice, is an unofficial Elvis fan podcast. Unofficial because myself or this show have no affiliation with Graceland or Elvis Presley Enterprises, also sometimes known as EPE. We're just huge fans here to have a good time talking Elvis, shining some light on all things Elvis, the king of rock and roll. If you didn't know, he's the king of rock and roll. Uh, quick fun fact, since I mentioned the king right away, right off the top, uh, did you know Elvis actually didn't like being called the king? At one show, someone had a, a sign, one of those signs, uh, saying Elvis is king. And Elvis, being very religious, told them politely, of course, to take the sign down and said, there's only one king. And he pointed up to heaven, the man up there. Uh, is the one true king and he said that more than one time so there's your first elvis fun fact right out of the gate explosion of a fun fact right away uh, it also shows the type of man that he was i love i love those stories as we go along i'm going to share many of those stories um just like that one just to show how unique and humble uh, a star he was and those like i said are my favorite favorite stories of Elvis. So what are we going to do here on this show? So should I start, should I start with this first off? First of all, I plead innocent of all charges. That's it. I plead innocent of all charges right off the bat. I should have said that right away. Um, so what are we going to try to do on the show? I'm going to try to give you some Elvis news current news what's going on in the elvis world these days because there's so much going on it's never ending which is amazing uh, i'm going to try to line up some interviews uh, from time to time with other elvis lovers hopefully people in the elvis world uh, we're going to try to do some top 10 lists some stories from elvis's life talk about his cultural impact music legacy that he left behind what does he mean to the world? Um, things like that. We're going to just try to have some fun talking about Elvis. If you're an Elvis lover, this is the show for you. We won't always just talk about Elvis. Um, but even if we're not, we're going to try to keep uh, an Elvis theme throughout. So if you're not an Elvis fan and you just want to watch a good show, this is the one for you. But there will be something for you if you're not a super Elvis fan. But hopefully watching this. You'll become an Elvis fan. Who knows? So we'll see. What I like to do, um, what I want to do to start off every show is um, something that I'm going to be calling the Elvis opening thought. This is the Elvis opening thought with the TCB lightning bolt sound right there. So how do you measure what Elvis meant and still means to the world, music, and popular culture? I'm going to try to touch on that a lot as the show goes on because you can't just pick one thing, but we could try to summarize it, right? With all things, you have to start at the beginning. As John Lennon once famously said, before Elvis, there was nothing. Those words sum it up perfectly. Before Elvis, there were singers, squeaky clean singers, who would color inside the lines and never dare step outside the box. John Lennon's nothing referred more to, I think, substance. 
Before Elvis, there was no substance. Singers and their music, it was bubblegum, wholesome family content. Even singers who wanted to get risky never had the guts or stomach to actually do it and face public ridicule and possibly the end of their careers. Because at that time, it was, you know, um, like I said, everything was very squeaky clean. You couldn't push the envelope. You couldn't do anything risque. And if you did, you know, people didn't like that. And, and, and pretty much that's, you know, a black spot on your career until Elvis. On July 18th, 1953, 18 year old Elvis went into 706 Union Avenue in Memphis, Tennessee, Sun Studios. He paid $3.98 to record his first of two double-sided acetates, My Happiness and That's When Your Heartaches Begin. Elvis said he wanted to make a, a record for his mother for her birthday, but many believe he wanted to hear what he sounded like on record. A year later, Elvis blows up the music scene and the world in what was dubbed the Big Bang of rock and roll. With That's All Right Mama, a story we're going to delve into later uh, in another episode because that's a whole story unto itself. Elvis wasn't afraid to literally shake up the world. As a truck driver for an electrical supply company, what did he have to lose? And he knew it. Most think Elvis stumbled upon Sun Records like it was an accident. Elvis was calculated and he knew what he was doing and it worked. He bet on himself and it worked. He would go on to change the world, the music scene, pop culture, how we think, act, dance, even speak. Elvis wasn't just a singer, he was an entertainer, a more complete form of singer who can do more than just one thing. Sing, dance, act, and put on a grand show experience for fans. John Lennon meant all this when he spoke before Elvis, there was nothing. Elvis somehow knew this too. So Marion Kiesker and Sam Phillips were business partners at Sun Studios. And when Elvis to came in to record for the first time, wanting to record something, Marion was at the front desk and she asked him, so who do you sound like? And Elvis replied, I don't sound like nobody. Even then he knew, even then at that young age, Elvis knew that he was unique. And that's the end of your opening thought. So what are we going to get to now? I want to definitely get to some, um, let's get to some Elvis news. What's going on in the world of Elvis these days. So first, right off the bat, we're going to discuss, um, Elvis's biopic that is being filmed in Australia. Queensland, Australia, uh, has wrapped up. Elvis has left the Queensland building. Uh, Austin Butler, who plays Elvis, we're going to show Austin Butler. There's Austin Butler right there. Austin Butler, who plays Elvis in the new Baz Luhrmann Elvis biopic, is headed back to the U.S. after filming is wrapped at the Australian studios. I think this was last week or two weeks ago. Uh, shooting is wrapped on the project and the 29 year old is heading home. I really think, I really think, uh, He's going to do an amazing job. He, he really, I was watching a YouTube clip of him the other day. Uh, this was before he, when he first got the role, he was just uh, speaking, I think it was the Oscars or something. And this is before he even started filming. He looks like him. He sounds like him. He's got, I'm sh you know, he's got the mannerisms. He, and, and with a little bit of, I'm sure training that he's gone through, he, I'd be very disappointed if he doesn't kill this. So really looking forward to this. Um, so he's done. He left the apartment building that he was living in, uh, while filming. Tom Hanks is also going to be in the movie, which how can you not love a movie that has Tom Hanks in it as well? He's playing the Colonel, the notorious manager, Colonel Tom Parker. Uh, the film is expected to be released in theaters June 2022 they had to change the date from 2021 uh, because of the pandemic uh, everyone knows the story which I think everyone's saying started the pandemic was when Tom Hanks and his wife got it uh, while in Australia I think it was pre-production for the Elvis biopic that they came down with COVID so they changed the date uh, Warner Brothers and they're pushing it back to 2022, June 2022, because they want to give it its proper 
um, theatrical run. They want it to be in theaters. They want people to see it in theaters. They don't just want to do the online streaming HBO Max thing. And I really don't want to see it that way. I've been waiting for this movie my whole life. I'm sure Elvis fans have been waiting for a movie like this for a long time. You know, style of Bohemian Rhapsody and Walk the Line. We've been I've been waiting for this forever, and I want to see it in theaters. I want to see it in theaters just like it should be seen. Here's just another photo of Austin Butler uh, packing up his stuff and leaving. Does he have to pack his own stuff? Or is that just is that just for the cameras? But anyways, there he goes. Uh, newcomer Austin Butler uh, is going to play Elvis, obviously Elvis, like I said. Um, Maggie Gyllenhaal is playing his mother, Gladys Presley. Tom Hanks, like I said, is the colonel. And what the, this movie uh, is described as focusing on Elvis's rise to stardom, really, uh, with particular focus on Elvis's relationship with the colonel. So that's really what this, this is about, uh, his, his rise to stardom and the relationship that, that they had, which was, you know, kind of, I guess you could describe it as, as love-hate. Lurman is producing the feature with his wife, Catherine Martin. He wrote the script with Craig Pierce, with whom he also wrote The Great Gatsby and Moulin Rouge. So those are his other movies there, quite popular movies as well. Um, so I don't, we don't, there's no name for it yet, but Elvis fans, like I said, and Elvis Presley Enterprises have massive high expectations for this movie. And they're trying to push him back into the main spotlight where he definitely belongs. So... Cannot wait for that. Cannot wait for that. Another little bit of Elvis news here. You see it right there. That is the 1968 comeback special. And what we're talking about here is the guitar in the photo. Elvis's iconic 68 comeback special, Hagstrom Viking 2 guitar, sells for $625,000 at auction. Uh, it went to auction maybe a couple of weeks ago now, and the bid started at 275000 That's starting, and it has finally sold for $625,000. This incredibly important artifact, uh, people have, have said, is one of the most historically significant and iconic instruments of all time, being that it was played by Elvis and the 68 comeback special, which, you know, threw him back into live performances. So um, it's an Im incredible piece of rock and roll history. Uh, it's the red, as you see there in the picture, like I'm saying, Hagstrom Viking 2 show guitar that was played by Elvis in the comeback special that was aired on NBC. Uh, it's been confirmed that the semi-hollow guitar has been sold, like I said, for $625,000 uh, with the proud new owner uh, managing to outbid six other bidders to get their hands on it. Wow, six other bidders. So that must have been an intense, intense auction, a little back and forth there. December 3rd, 1968 marked Elvis's return to live performances after seven years during which he just did movies. Uh, the special was transformed by Steve Binder and producer Bob Finkel to create a concert that would be current and appeal to a younger audience. And it did. Elvis played this guitar in several segments of the show, and it's also here on the cover of the RCA album from Elvis in Memphis. This guitar actually belonged to another musician called, uh, named Al Casey, uh, who performed in the backing band during the special. According to the letter that comes with it, he was asked to let Elvis use the guitar by the producers as they thought it would look beautiful on camera with the set, being that it's red, black, and that was kind of the theme uh, of the whole show, and were they ever right? Elvis used the guitar for the opening segment as well as during one of the live stand-up segments that he does if you've ever watched the show. If you haven't, what are you waiting for? The guitar comes with a notarized letter with, uh, of authenticity from Al Casey, a second letter uh, authenticated by Casey, a notarized statement from Hal Blaine, who was the drummer on the 1968 special, and a letter from legendary producer Bones Howe who was the music producer on the special. So this stunning piece of history has not been offered to the public for over 25 years. Crazy. Along with the letters, the winner of the auction also received a collection of photographs of Elvis 
from the special, playing the guitar, as well as various loan paperwork. Forms from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum, where the Hagstrom previously resided as part of of an Elvis exhibit. And despite selling for six figures, the Hagstrom isn't the most expensive Elvis-owned guitar to be sold in recent times. Last year, Elvis's Sun Sessions Martin D18 acoustic guitar went for $1.32 million. So Elvis stuff, worth a lot of money, obviously. So we have one more piece of news for you on this day as well, April 7th. 1965, MGM released Elvis's 17th movie, Girl Happy, nationwide. So there you go. On this day, April 7th in 1965, Elvis released Girl Happy to the U.S. and eventually the world. So there you go. Hold it. Hold it. Yeah. yeah, I'm out of breath. I got I to gotta stop talking. I'm out of breath. All right, guys. It is time for our top 10 list. That is right. Our top 10 best Elvis jumpsuits. His karate style jumpsuits that he wore on stage and in concert. We're gonna count down the top 10 best Elvis jumpsuits as we say here on the show, we think they're the, the top 10 uh, best jumpsuits. So let's get right into it. At number 10, we have the Black Conquisitor. The Black Conquisitor. Other names for this jumpsuit were the Black Way Down suit. Elvis wore uh, this suit around late 1972. Uh, there was also a white version. Um, called the White Conquisitor. A picture of Elvis wearing the suit was featured on the cover of Elvis' 1977 single release of Way Down. And that's the reason why fans labeled it and started referring it, uh, to it as the Black Way Down suit. So that's number 10, the Black Conquisitor. Number nine is the Alpine suit. The Alpine suit right there. Other names for the Alpine suit, the chicken rib, interesting, the bear claw, and the black Aztec. The black Aztec. Elvis first wore this suit during his 1975 July tour. He wore it several times during the tour and then at least once uh, during his following Vegas engagement. Although an original belt was made for the suit, Elvis didn't wear it when uh, he first started using the suit. Instead, he wore the belt that was originally designed for the one uh, for one of the 1970, 1975 dark blue two-piece suits, light blue armadillo and large scale. So that is number nine, the alpine suit. At number eight, we have the tiger suit. I love this suit. Look at that <clears throat> suit. Uh, you didn't see Elvis wearing too much. Uh, I haven't seen many uh, pictures or footage with him wearing the suit, but I think it's a super cool suit. Matches Elvis's personality right there, the tiger. This suit is, uh, like we said, it's called the tiger suit or mad tiger, as some call it. This was only worn for a short time during 1974. Uh, so that's probably why I said off the top, we you haven't seen much of it. Uh, a few dates of Elvis wearing the suit, uh, September 30th, 1974. 8.30 p.m. show, South Bend, Indiana, October the 5th, 1974, Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana, and October the 7th, 1974, Wichita, Kansas. A uh, few notable times Elvis wore that suit, which, like we said, wasn't many. So that was number eight. Number seven, the powder blue, one of my favorites. One of my favorites is the powder blue suit. I love this one, just classic. Elvis first, Elvis first wore this jumpsuit in Las Vegas during his 1972 January, February engagement. This was one of the jumpsuits Elvis wore also during the filming of the 1972 documentary Elvis on tour. It's the first time I saw this suit and fell in love with it. It was a great movie great documentary and he wore this one and just an awesome suit cool color I, I like it a lot 
Nowadays, the suit is in private hands and is owned by a well-known collector. Can you imagine being that collector right there, owning one of his suits? I wonder what that went for. We got to find out that info. That was number seven. Number six, the chain suit. Another one of my favorites. This is the suit that he wore, and that's the way it is. One of the suits um, in 1969, uh, 1970. Uh, I love this suit. This one, uh, one of his coolest ones. I think the chain suit, love the chains. By the end of the show, they're all falling off and dangling. Looks awesome. The chain suit was first worn during the early part of the 1970 August September Las Vegas engagement. Like I said, while MGM was filming Elvis, that's the way it is documentary. Elvis wore the suit several times during 1970 with several different belts. All in all, it was worn with at least five different belts. Such a super cool, super cool suit. That's number six. Number five, the burning love suit cool cool red suit here one of the three pinwheel suits elvis had uh the other two black pinwheel and white pinwheel there was no original uh matching belt design for the suit but as mentioned above elvis wore the gold attendance belt with it a picture of elvis in this suit was featured on the cover of his 1972 burning love single which i remember i think my parents had a copy of that so that's why i really remember this red suit that is where the fans got the nickname for the suit, the Burning Love Suit. Although Elvis uh, only wore the suit in 1972, it's clearly a 1971 design and was commissioned that year. This is the only red jumpsuit Elvis ever wore or had, which makes it quite special. The complete suit, suit plus cape, again, is owned by a private collector. That's the Burning Love Suit. Number... Four, the sundial suit. This is Elvis's sundial suit, also very cool suit. The Mexican sundial made its debut during the very short October 1974 Tahoe engagement, but after that, it wasn't ever worn again until 1977. Although some claim that there were at least two versions made of the suit, it's definitely not true. There was only one version made, and this has uh, been confirmed by. Jean Doucet, Elvis's original wardrobe designer. This was the suit that was uh, worn during the filming of the 1977 TV special Elvis in Concert, uh, as well as his last concert ever um, on June 26, 1977 in Indianapolis. So that makes it, you know, a bittersweet suit because really cool, but uh, unfortunately it's the last one he ever wore, so. That's number four, the sundial suit. Number three, the peacock suit. Also cool, also very rare, but I think that makes it even cooler. When Elvis first wore this suit, he didn't wear it with the original belt, but with the white Spanish flower belt instead. According to the rumors, this was the most expensive suit Elvis ever got, costing about $10,000. In early August 2008, this suit was sold at auction for $300,000 which is the most anyone, uh, as far as private collectors, has ever paid for an original suit worn by Elvis. 300000 So that was number three, the peacock suit. Number two, the phoenix suit. Another rare but cool suit there with the phoenix wings and all that. The eagle on the phoenix suit wasn't originally designed as a bird. Believe it or not, the original design was supposed to be two zebra heads bowing into each other. But when Elvis saw the sketches, his first comment was, that bird has funny feet. As he was looking at the sketch upside down, upside down, he was looking at the sketch upside down. I think even Elvis would laugh at that. <laughs> yeah, even Elvis would laugh at that, looking at the sketch upside down. Uh, so that made it look like a bird. But if you look at the design upside down, you can still see the two zebras uh, are in there. So the Black Phoenix, the Black Phoenix was possibly made and delivered for Elvis in 1974, just like the 1974 Turquoise Phoenix. But so far, no evidence has surfaced that Elvis would have worn it back then. The first photographical evidence of Elvis wearing the suit comes from the 1975 May-June tour. 
As with the Red Phoenix, there were at least two original matching belts designed for the suit as well. The first version was worn only in 1975. So there is the Phoenix suit right there. Awesome suit. Love that. And we head to number one. Number one. What do you guys think it is? I think even Elvis, non-Elvis fans or occasional Elvis fans should know what the number one suit is. Ready? Number one. That's my drum roll. The American Eagle suit. I think everyone has seen this one before. This is the classic, iconic Elvis suit. The Aloha from Hawaii suit. Two almost identical versions were made of this suit, which were both worn during the Aloha shows. Apparently, the suit Elvis wore during the rehearsal show, because there were two films. Uh, that show was filmed twice. One was a rehearsal show that was filmed as a just-in-case-something-happened. Uh, they would air that show. Um, so two versions of the show were filmed. I like the original one, obviously, and I like the original suit better because the first one, yeah, it, if you go back and look at the, the rehearsal footage, it does look a little baggy, a little too big for him. This was much more fitted. Uh, it's also the version Elvis wore later on on tour and in Vegas in 1973 and 1974. Three belts were made for this suit. The first one was never worn on stage as Elvis gave it to actor Jack Lord, who was at the show, uh, one of his favorite actors, as a gift before he ever got to wear it. The second belt was identical to the first one, and it was worn during the two Aloha shows. The third belt had some minor differences, and it was worn every time Elvis wore the suit after the Aloha special. Elvis also wore the third American Eagle belt with the 1974 American Eagle jumpsuit in May 1974 on tour and in Tahoe. So there you go. That's the Elvis Top 10. All righty. That's the end of the top 10 right there for you guys. So, guys, that's pretty much it for episode one. Man, I just work here. Man, I just work here. Don't shoot the messenger. Uh, that... <laughs> That's definitely it for episode one, guys. We're keeping it light, light, light for the first show. Uh, hopefully everyone enjoyed the first show of the King's Cast. Tune in for episode two. Um, we're going to let Elvis take us out. We'll meet you again. God bless you. Adios. So, guys, hopefully in the coming weeks, we will have a few interviews for you. I'm trying to line up a few interviews, interviews from a couple of authors who wrote a couple of fantastic Elvis books. One most notably is called De Destined to Die Young by Sally A. Hodel. It's a fantastic and I think groundbreaking book that talks about Elvis's death and how lifelong health issues were passed down to him and pretty much made it inevitable that he was going, that he was going to die at a young age. So hopefully timing works out and I can bring that interview to you guys. So stay tuned. Thanks for watching. Please like, share, comment below. Follow on Instagram and TikTok at the King's Cast. Don't forget to subscribe. Stay safe. Be kind to one another. Continue to TCB and never forget through the history of time, many have been called royalty, but there's only one king of rock and roll. Good night, guys. Elvis has left the building.